so that uh, mm -hmm. we can post it on our website and mm -hmm. people that weren't able to attend the meeting can enjoy it in, in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so before we I introduce our speakers, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items and uh, give you some updates about the Historical Society. Um, first, the best way to view this is if you click on the upper right corner on speaker view and um, put, let's see, put your screen to speaker mode by clicking on the speaker view in the top right corner. So that way you only see the speaker instead of seeing everybody. And if um, I see that you're, most of you are muted, but if you're not, kindly click on the microphone in the lower left corner. At the end of the presentation, we will do a Q&A in which you will have the opportunity to, um, you know, unmute yourself and ask questions. And in the interim, if you want to put a question in the chat box, please feel free to do that. I'd also like to know how you heard about the meeting tonight, if you can put that in the chat box as well. It helps us for how we promote the programs. Um, and I would like to thank Lorraine for um, helping organize and uh, Lorraine Harton Gallardi for organizing the event um, and working with the speakers and doing the, the advertising, social media, et cetera. So thank you, Lorraine. Um, let's see. Uh, so some of you know that we moved from 17 South Avenue to larger quarters at the former rectory of the, of St. Joachim's Church on six, at 61 Leonard. And the building is so spectacular. It's bright. Warm. It has, I think, nine foot ceilings. It's spacious. Um, wait till you see the, the library and resource room that we're... We're going to open. Um, sure. It's just going to be really a fantastic opportunity oh, for preserving our archives, for welcoming uh -huh. visitors, wel welcoming researchers. So it's going to be a wonderful place, and I'm really excited about it. Um, thanks to the multitude of volunteers that have helped us with packing, unpacking, cleaning, all of the small things to the large things. Uh, the next large thing is we will be putting in a handicap ramp and an ADA. A compliant bathroom and once that's in place and we have the certificate certificate of occupancy we're going to start to welcome people in in small numbers so we're looking forward to opening the building uh, for researchers and visitors and you'll be notified you know through our newsletter and on our Facebook page and Instagram so um, I think that's about it um, I'd like to introduce our guest speakers for the evening it's Bill Jeffway, who is the executive director at the Dutchess County Historical Society, and Melody Moore, who is the collections chair at the Historical Society. They work together on exhibits and programming. And I'm gonna turn the floor over to you guys uh, for this really fascinating talk. You will re very much enjoy it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Diane. And it's great to be with the Beacon Historical Society. You're the real deal. So uh, we're, we're prepared to be our best here and expect some good questions at the end. But it's always a pleasure to be a part of the Beacon Historical Society. We have a great, great group uh, and a great reputation. So uh, it was actually a couple of years ago, Melody and I were looking at the uh, 100th anniversary, 2020, of women gaining the right to vote nationally. It coincided with our receiving a very large collections gift that Melody will talk about um, relating to an artist in LaGrange. And it struck us that although there were obviously uh, political voices and political actions that created change for women, sometimes women just stepping forward into fields where men had preferred to keep things to themselves um, was as just as revolutionary. So we uh, came up with the idea of, of talking about this concept. And now we have to hope uh, all our screen sharing works. Sorry, one second. One moment. It's gonna be a I'm hoping you can see, uh, yes, there we go, finally. Uh, this is the concept I was leading to. Uh, Melody and I were talking about the idea of looking at how, uh, in recognition of women gaining the right to vote nationally, how women used both 
uh, political voices and actions and their own talents to, to create change. Uh, is that full screen all right? Is that viewable, everybody? Yeah, good, thumbs up. Thank you. So- It looks great. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, I'll talk us through the political period. It's a big enough period that you end up with two generations really. Um, and when you look through the lens of Dutchess County, uh, you can especially appreciate that the first generation was very involved by Quakerism, uh, Dutchess County having such a big Quaker population. And second, how the degree to which it was influenced by Vassar College, and, uh, which was a means of helping bring um, a lot of diverse voices together, actually. And um, Melody will then uh, talk us through the talent side, uh, as I said, uh, uh, looking at Caroline Clough's reputation, which we hope uh, we've been able to restore to some degree. When we look at the political side, uh, it's such a vast gap. Um, one of the most visible suffrage leaders, Carrie Chapman Catt, was in Poughkeepsie visiting Vassar College in 1938, and she described the effort of women's suffrage as the struggle of a, quote, 72-year campaign won by the devoted capacity of many women to perform drudgery. And it really was that 72-year span from the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848 to women gaining the right to vote nationally um, that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. We break it down into three categories. 1848 to 1880 marks the Seneca Falls Convention, and 1880, the year that women gained the right to vote in New York State in school elections. Uh, the kind of intergenerational period between 1880 and 1900 and then the run-up really 1900 to 1920, and within that really the last uh, decade. This first period from the convention to 1880, four out of the five organizers of Seneca Falls were Quakers, and each of the four Quakers had some ties to Dutchess County, uh, some more than others, either through the Nine Partners boarding school or through family ties. Um, the idea that women could gain the right to vote in school elections showed the kind of comfort with women being involved in, in things related to children, uh, as well as the fact that they were paying property taxes and school taxes. Uh, and that was kind of the hard end of the question. Um, and they deserved representation. But in this uh, interim period, between 1880 and 1900, between the two generations, there's not necessarily a lot in political terms, but there are big symbolic things. Bella Lockwood runs for president. She actually does so twice, not, with not much hope that, it, that she would win, but still is making a point. And there are important national conversations about women's place and role. And the term, the new woman, came to be talked about, uh, sometimes derided and laughed at, uh, and sometimes celebrated and applauded. And the bicycle became a symbol of that new woman and her independence. And that uh, also involved uh, dress reform and, and, and physical uh, poise and culture. In the third stage, in this last leg, it, it really is from 1910 to 1920, where you see a real groundswell locally Vassar Professor Laura Wiley on the left there, she's exemplary in demonstrating that the historic women's college had finally allowed its professors to speak out on suffrage. She helped form and became head of the local Equal Suffrage League. And that league reached out to all strata of the society, the elite estates, Vassar College students and professors, uh, middle class, factory and working class, and a special outreach to the African-American community. And this was with an eye on a New York State referendum, which uh, occurred in 1915 and failed. But two years later, 1917 passed. And uh, it's very telling that Laura Wiley, when New York women gained the right to vote in the 1917 referendum, did not concern themselves with the remaining national <laughs> gaps where women couldn't vote, but instead created very active civic groups to create and address social change and civic change. They didn't want uh, the right to vote as kind of a matter of principle. They actually had very specific things they wanted to get done. So 
I'd like to point out that uh, really up until the bitter end, uh, many men were saying women were not uh, designed for anything but raising children and backing their husbands. But I couldn't help but think, even in 1848, it was 10 years into the reign of Queen Victoria, uh, who lent her name to, uh, <laughs> to an era, and the first Queen Elizabeth, who also lent her name to an era. So the men who were saying women really weren't up to the task uh, must have known that they were uh, not really quite uh, telling the truth. And it's interesting that Seneca Falls was the location because the Seneca native people were among the Iroquois Five Nation people where women had leadership roles and clan mothers. And they, they had roles that were equal to men. They had some roles that were superior to men. And uh, there's this cartoon kind of pointing out uh, the Indian women are saying, we whom you pity as drudges reached centuries ago, the goal that you are nearing uh, as the suffragists parade by. So, you know, I think there was a lot of denial in some of the arguments and it was ultimately uh, meant to be. We talked about the, uh, the organization a bit for Seneca Falls. And I wanted to take a minute to talk about the Quakers in Dutchess County. Um, they arrived in the early 1700s, leaving Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Westchester to find peace and quiet and isolation. And uh, they then found with the uh, evolution of the Revolutionary War and the Fishkill Supply Depot that uh, they needed to go further north. And this uh, pushed them up in the 1800s late 1700s, 1800s, further north and into the middle and spread out more in the county. And I think it's the only reason I wanna point this out is you will see that the few first steps where the right for women to vote emerged in the county followed the pattern of where the Quaker Thank strongholds you. were. Yeah. So as soon as they took the EKG, it was very Quake, uh, Dutchess County had the largest Quaker population outside of Philadelphia, and its real jewel in the crown was the Nine Partners Boarding School um, at Millbrook. Lucretia Coffin Mott uh, was first a uh, student there, then became a teacher. She met her husband there, uh, and she later wrote that the school had a very profound uh, effect on her. So I like to call her the face of radical feminism in 1848. And of course it was really radical what, what she was advocating. But we can look at other Quakers. Um, remember that Quakerism had a split in 1827, the Hicksite separation. And some of these women who were born Quakers did not remain in the Quaker faith, but took those principles and worked them uh, out in different ways. The town of Milan's Julia Wilbur attended nine partners. She went uh, south. She was arguing for equal pay of women teachers in 1857. She was citing statistics that women were only paid half or a third of what men uh, were getting paid. So I guess that's up from the 77% today is up from the past. But she moved to Virginia during the Civil War, uh, arguing for abolitionist cause. She cared for sick and wounded, and then she attempted to vote. Washington DC to make a point, um, which is a criminal action. The town of Clinton, Elizabeth Powell Bond became Dean of Swarthmore College. It's interesting to note along the way, she was the first gymnastics teacher at Vassar College, just to this point that women's health and fitness uh, and dress was part of the revolution in their thinking. And also from Clinton, third on the right, the universalist preacher, the Reverend Amanda Deo, where her husband ran the Peace Society in Dutchess County. And they would bring thousands of people together um, at Wiley's Grove in Clinton. Mer Melody will speak of Mariah Mitchell, but I'll mention her because she beautifully expresses the limitations at the time uh, on professors. She was the founder of the American Association for Advancement of Women, becoming its president in 1874. And the group's aims were securing higher intellectual, moral, and physical conditions for women, thereby improving all domestic and social relations. And very much not politics and not uh, uh, the, the, the right to vote. Um, and while Mariah Mitchell 
and other professors were expected to limit their uh, speaking on this topic. Uh, Mariah Mitchell was not shy about bringing in some high powered speakers. And in 1868, she invited Anna Dickinson, another uh, Quaker, nationally known suffrage advocate. She was famous for her talk, Idiots and Women, making the argument that these two uh, conditions, if you will, uh, for not being able to vote that prohibited voting in New York State were, were not sensible. And Matthew Vassar offered some uh, kind of vaguely supportive words in a private letter after she spoke, but he actually was at the observatory and managed to kind of sneak out before she actually gave the talk. And I think this reflects a general feeling that uh, but politics was, was a step too far, even at something as progressive and radical at the time as Vassar College. And I don't want to leave out the Methodists. The Armenia Seminary uh, was also very progressive in this regard, and it produced several women who insisted on being preachers. Uh, the Methodist Semi Seminary was a, a very prominent school. And one of the examples there that we can talk about is a woman named Katie Lent born in Columbia County and the daughter of a preacher, I see that her father, Martin Lent, uh, served as a Methodist minister in Beacon, among other places. And uh, she was inspired to attend the Amenia Cemetery. She went to Boston University School of Theology. She became a licensed preacher in the Poughkeepsie District. They met at the Methodist Church at Washington Street that's shown there uh, and became a licensed preacher. Yeah. The challenge she had was with the national organization. And there was a woman who wrote, it was a, there was a terribly uh, tough discussion, even at the Poughkeepsie district, about whether to license uh, Miss Katie Lent, as she was at the time. And uh, Helen Loder writes that the, there was a spirited discussion in 1878 at the uh, conference. And after a long debate, the local conference voted in favor 44 to 26. But two years later, she got bumped out by the national conference. And she decided rather than fight the Methodists, she would get involved with the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And she became a national, internationally known leader. And if you can imagine what it's like at the turn of the last century to travel to these places, she was uh, going to places like Hawaii, Japan, China, Australia, New Zealand, India, Burma, Ceylon, Egypt, Palestine, Greece, and Italy. She must have <laughs> some, had some good physical strength. Her biggest uh, claim to fame, though, was writing a song that remains to this day very, act, uh, very much part of the women's uh, the WCTU. So that also shows you the kind of interdependency or interwovenness of temperance, quality for women, and other issues introduce you also to Widow Van Cott. She was the first woman licensed preacher, uh, Methodist preacher in 1869. Um, the New York Times declared that she was the, the only licensed female preacher. And uh, the dateline of the New York Times article is Madeline in Red Hook, where she had a huge uh, number of conversions. She was a very successful and motivating speaker, which is how success was measured in those days, how many conversions you could get. Uh, so, and she remained, although she, she never worried about a national license, uh, she was happy to just keep on going with the local license. Mm -hmm. Anna Howard Shaw, I talk about in the third section after 1900, and she's not local, she's from Michigan. But I want to mention her only because she also attended Boston University Theological Seminary. She also was involved in the uh, Methodist Church uh, in attempting to become a preacher. And she was also involved in the WCTU before getting involved in uh, women's suffrage. So you begin to see a, a pattern and a kind of overlap of, of interests here. By 1880, uh, there is this landmark achievement where women get the right to vote in school elections. Uh, there was a feeling that women's approach to school matters and children in, in some cases were even uh, better than men. Um, and that was kind of both good news and bad news. The, the good news is they get a thumbs up for doing so. The bad news is the feeling was, well, you really should just be limited to that. And this is a nice photo of Clara Sitzer teaching in Rock City in town of Milan, where I live. And uh, 
the interesting thing about her uh, is that she was an advocate. Uh, this picture was taken around the time that the uh, a, a flag day and the Pledge of Allegiance was introduced through school in 1992 on Columbus Day. And these teachers, when you read about what they were doing, had a lot of responsibility with these children. But if they became married, they had to uh, actually give up teaching. You could not be a married woman and teach, I guess, you could be neglecting your own children and husband. Um, and here we have at the bottom a tax list, Marietta Frost and Emma Gasly and others in the town of Clinton showing up on the tax list. So this was kind of the hard edge of the argument with the soft edge was women are good with children. The hard edge was, hey, we pay taxes. And then if you look at as the law permitting women to vote in New York in 1880 uh, came about, if you look at where women started to vote. You see, again, it's along the pattern of the Quaker strongholds. Stanford's election of a school trustee, uh, trustee uh, was involved a man who was very uh, outspoken about the equal treatment of women. Coffin Summit in Millbrook, which is dead center in the middle there, is named for the family of Lucretia Coffin Mott, it's now called Oak Grove. Um, there was a woman nominated to be school trustee. Six women voted, but the candidate lost. And when you look at other places like Arlington uh, that involved Vassar students mm -hmm. and the orange dots in Poughkeepsie that reflect women who were not even allowed to register, they got rebuffed registering. You see uh, the, the very first cracks, you put a little star though uh, by Unionvale because it's actually in Unionvale, you have this historic moment where Nancy Boyd Duncan school teacher in Dover and a daughter of Irish immigrants becomes the first woman elected to anything in the county. And uh, she is uh, a mother with five children, but it wins this uh, situation where she steps forward as a candidate. So you have the tiniest steps in 1880 towards some sort of action with uh, candidacy and voting. <laughs> I mentioned Helen Loader. She was the uh, woman writing about the trials and tribulations of, uh, of those becoming a preacher, Methodist preacher, women preacher. And I, I like to talk about her because she was a woman ahead of her time in that she's a working class woman and she was a daughter of Irish immigrants. immigrants. Her husband was a freight handler for the railroad, their house on North Hamilton Street in Poughkeepsie was adjacent to the railroad tracks, but she was everywhere in terms of organizing, speaking, and writing. And she even ends up on the uh, ticket in support of Bella Lockwood running for president. But she is an exception and she stands out um, as a working class woman who was perhaps 50, 50 years, 40 years ahead of her time. And you can, I think, see the gap in generations when you look at her obituary in 1903. It reads, this is how the Poughkeepsie paper uh, announced that she was living in Rhode Island by then, uh, Long Island by then. Helen Loder, formerly of Poughkeepsie, died at her home Sunday after a brief illness. She was at one time a very prominent temperance worker in Poughkeepsie and took an active part in the women's suffrage movement, at one time holding the position of state's secretary. And you can kind of hear the uh, the distance uh, and distant memory of, of all that um, as that generation kind of comes to a close. Not a lot happens politically in these two decades, but they're very important periods for uh, discussions about what women's potential is uh, and, and can be. And the head of the WCTU, Francis Willard, actually writes a book about how I learned to ride the bicycle which could easily be read as how I learned to be independent, the bicycle becoming the, the real symbol for women's independence. There's a wonderful series of photos in her book um, showing her first getting trained by men, then she gets a little help from women. And my favorite on the far right there, you can see it says, at last, her husband, I suppose, is in the back there in the dust somewhere. And this was a very popular concept. Uh, the, the, uh, of thinking of the bicycle as the kind of symbol of women's freedom and independence. 
and we had a little contest on Facebook to ask for people to send their mother, their grandmother and great grandmother's photos from the period on bicycles. And we got some good submissions. And my favorite though is in the middle there, a photo courtesy of Jean Gard's uh, grandmother in Poughkeepsie on a bicycle looking very determined. So that was kind of, that was kind of fun. It's in the 1890 that we find uh, this woman, Mabel Jeunesse, who's a nationally known figure on physical culture speaking at the Vassar Institute, now the Kudin Hackett Center. Bloomers were introduced in the 1850s uh, to give women more freedom. And you'll recall Elizabeth Powell Bond was teaching gymnastics in the 1860s, but it really is this period in the 1880s and 90s where the concept of comprehensive physical culture starts to become important and associated with dress reform. And uh, uh, it, it kind of brings together a more holistic approach and it brings concepts together about women's uh, own responsibilities to themselves and freedom to make choices about themselves. But it really is this last segment where the second generation really starts to emerge after 1900, um, where uh, women step forward uh, and, and create very strong and effective local organizations that bring, that bring people together. I kind of mark, it's worth looking at 1901 because there's a little bit of a flash in the pan in that in 1901, remember I had mentioned uh, Anna Shaw, uh, she's now older, but she held a suffrage uh, rally in Poughkeepsie in 1901. And not a lot happened after that, but it was really the beginning of the first step of the second generation the creation of the Equal Suffrage League. From 1910, you see Laura Wiley emerge. So she's on the left holding the dog. Well, they're both holding the dog, but <laughs> she's the founder and leader of the Equal Suffrage League, a Vassar professor. She's the role, exemplary role model of the new Vassar professor. She's emboldened to speak and act for suffrage to hold events at her house. On campus at Vassar, we find that uh, in 1912, college uh, president Taylor reluctantly agreed to uh, rescind the ban on suffrage activities, but he really is a fish out of water and he ends up retiring three years later, allowing a much more progressive president, Henry Melvin McCracken to come in. Still, while he was more comfortable living off campus, she lived in the house that you can still see at the Soldier's Fountain. She lived with her partner, Gertrude Buck, equally indicative of the time and role of uh, women activists, Wiley was seeking the right to vote, not as a principle, as I said, but to get to these to the point where laws uh, through the ballot and civic organizations to deploy people could actually really create change. And the kind of change they wanted to uh, uh, look at were homes like this is these are pictures of Lincoln Center in Poughkeepsie that looked at underprivileged uh, girls in this instance. Um, it was a very active time when Vassar College was very involved with the city of Poughkeepsie, especially in uh, a lot of civic reform. The thing I wrap up with on this segment though is the the, the road to success really was the unity and breadth of the diverse social classes in the county all coming together. And of course, given Laura Wiley's leadership, uh, there was no shortage of Vassar College voices, whether that was professors, whether that was alumni like Harriet Stanton Blatch, Vassar 78, or uh, uh, students at the college working the polls or handing out leaflets. Um, but beyond that, in addition to the uh, Vassar folks, you have the elite ladies of Dutchess County. Uh, Ruth Morgan from Statsburg is, uh, ends up becoming the first, uh, the second president of the Colony Club in New York City. And she, so she, she kind of bridges New York City and Dutchess County um, and ends up being the head of the Red Cross in France in World War I. Margaret Chandler Aldrich uh, out of Berrytown is very active. They, they set up the networks to mirror congressional districts. She was in charge of one 
Amy Spingarn on the far right out of Troutwick was in charge of another, Margaret Lewis Morgan Norrie, also out of Statsburg. Uh, was, all these women were visible at a national level, but you would find them in the basement hall of the local Grange. And uh, these women spanned great, vast, <laughs> Uh, conceptual differences. There was no TV and radio, and the only the kind of way you reached mass people was through pageants and parades. And uh, a lot of people are aware of the 1913 march in Washington, uh, but there was a predecessor, a smaller one, where General Rosalie Jones, as she was called, led a parade of pilgrims from New York City to Albany. And they made five overnight stops in Dutchess County. And they did so in the dead of December uh, as Christmas was approaching while it was snowing. So God bless them for, for showing their, their perseverance and endurance. But these were really uh, targeting people, working class people, as was this tableau that was done um, at the uh, Troutbeck home of the Spingarns the Western states like Alaska and Kansas uh, have all gone su toward suffrage and the question why not New York. And similarly, here's a few more images from that 1912 pageant. Again, these were targeting factory workers, farmers, the more everyday people. There was a specific meeting in 1914 with the Equal Suffrage Re League reaching out to African-Americans through their church. Of course, the women wanted the black men who could vote uh, to do so in support of the amendment in 1915. And the woman who stepped up and at that time read a poem called A Call to Suffrage turned out to later become very uh, nationally famous for her work at Tuskegee Veterans Hospital, treating World War I veterans coming back who are hurt physically and emotionally through reading. This was before we had televisions dangling down above our hospital beds to make us feel better. And she really created what was recognized as a science of bibliotherapy, uh, of, of crafting the right reading for the right uh, requirement to heal. So 1915, you also have this transition of power to the more progressive McCracken, but still uh, all this uh, aside, the referendum fails in New York State Everybody has to keep on working. And the results in the county are a little more progressive, uh, but still 57 election districts still said no, 11 said yes. And again, those areas where there, at least there were some signs of yes tended to be the, uh, the Quaker areas. Um, it's finally really the World War I that pushes things over the edge because suddenly with agriculture being so important to Dutchess County and the men in the fields needing to go to Europe and camps, people suddenly started to see women do it, effectively doing things like uh, uh, driving a tractor. This is a Vassar College student. Uh, women were becoming, they were operating trolley lines. Uh, they were working in factories. Colored women were allowed to work in factories. They came up with the idea of having a policewoman and people like Nina McCullough Mattern turned her um, suffrage activities to war activities. And this could not be uh, ignored or, or go unnoticed. And the national defense, uh, sorry, the state defense um, operation run by the governor uh, asked each county to develop defense councils that included women. And there started to be a sense that women have got to be in the in, involved if we're going to win this war. The county turns around to towns like Milan and says, you, when you do develop your defense committee, you'll, you've got to come up with uh, and include women also. So it really is out of the necessity of World War I that the state comes around and votes yes. I am sorry to say, though, that Dutchess County did not say yes. Uh, there were still 44 election districts saying no, 32 said yes. And, uh, but all that really mattered was what was happening at a statewide level. New York State uh, gets to um, allow women to vote in this way. Um, there's a wonderful sentiment expressed by Violet Barber um, 
that talks that says, uh, speaking generally, one may say that women gained more and lost less from our experience to war than did men. And what she's really saying is that if, if we want to create change that's profound, that has economic change and real social change, we have to stick to the to stick to what we learned from the war uh, in, in terms of surprising <laughs> ourselves that we can do new things. And so women like her start to emerge. Uh, women like Anna Roselle start to emerge and run for uh, office. Anna Roselle runs and wins. She becomes the first uh, woman elected to something beyond the school as overseer of the poor in Clinton. And uh, we, we got in touch with her family and they told us many nice things about Anna Roselle uh, as she was a school teacher for many years. And uh, she was also arguing for better pay or equal pay for teachers. Um, remember that was happening in 1857. It was happening uh, in the 1920s and 30s through her as well. So I end by just saying that the, the organizations that the women uh, really set up that became the vehicles for change were the Women's City and County Club and maybe the more familiar League of Women Voters um, that we're all more, more familiar with, but that it was in the end, this breadth of uh, the, the two generations <laughs> having this long view, and then this real breadth of social class and diversity of uh, women of, of all parts of society coming together with one big push uh, and illuminated by World War I. So that's kind of a race to the finish uh, on the path from 1848 to 1920. And I think we're gonna just take any questions at the end, uh, all questions at the end after Melody has a chance to go through her, her section on talents. Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, Bill has revealed the many women of Duchess who successfully use their voices to push for greater rights for women and specifically the right to vote. I'd like to end our program by turning to the second part of our 2020 theme, women's talents, and specifically the talent of one woman of Dutchess County, Caroline Morgan Clouds. 19 of her paintings, dozens of her sketches, and hundreds of letters were gifted to the society in 2019. We, working with historians, art historians, appraisers, and family members, have come to believe that she was one of, if not the best, animal painter in America of her time. Here are a few examples of her wonderful paintings. And Bill will just advance through them so you get a sense of the quality of the work that she was doing. Um, and obviously you can tell that animal paintings were her strong suit. Beginning in 2012, the Historical Society was the recipient of an enormous collection of materials related to the Hart Hubbard family of LaGrange. And you can see that these boxes, some of which have been processed and others that have not been, literally take up one whole room at the Clinton House in Poughkeepsie. In 1838, the Hart family moved from Long Island, and here are the two people who moved up. Um, from Long Island to Dutchess County and established an apple orchard in business that would continue for 125 years. The thousands of documents in the archive detail not only their business life, but their personal life as well. The same year that Benjamin and Elizabeth Hart came to Overlook Road in the town of LaGrange, Benjamin's sister Elizabeth, Ann Clowes, shown here on the left, gave birth on Long Island to her second daughter, Caroline. The first child born to Elizabeth, Lydia, shown on the left, had been born two years earlier in 1836. Another daughter, Ellen, sadly died um, after shortly, excuse me, um, Caroline's mother gave birth to another daughter, Ellen, uh, sadly, Elizabeth Clowes only survived her daughter's birth by two months, and on Christmas Eve 1840, she died, following at least two years of wasting away with consumption. On her deathbed, 
she wrote out her burial wishes and penned parting letters to each of her three daughters. Still more sorrow followed when on October 10th, 1841, baby Ellen, not quite a year old, passed away. Caroline and her sister Lydia were left motherless to be cared for by their father, William Jones Clowes. Records suggest that William was at best a distracted father, fanatically interested in mathematical theories that he felt could bridge the gap between faith and science. Here are just a very few images from his extensive notebooks that will give you a sense of how his mind worked. Um, these images display mathematical theories that are barely understandable today. And Bill's got a couple examples of them. I think Bill finds these fascinating. Trying to figure out what William Clowes is all about. Um, it goes to say, however, that he was ill-equipped to find a way to ensure the financial security of his daughters. We have hundreds and hundreds of his letters, many not as yet read, um, and most focused on ideas that were then and now barely understandable. By 1851, it was becoming very clear to extended family members that something had to be done about Lydia and Caroline, who were now 15 and 13, respectively, and virtual, if not true, orphans. Here in the story is where fate plays a hand. While we don't know the specifics about how the decision was made, we do know that it was decided that the sisters would be split up and each would go to live with different family members. Lydia, to her Aunt Lizzie, sometimes called Betsy, and her husband, shown here, the Reverend Reuben Lindsay Coleman, who were living in Virginia. And Caroline, to her mother's brother, Benjamin Hallhart, and his wife, Elizabeth, now living in LaGrange. The two households could not have been more different. Mrs. Coleman, now Lydia's foster mother, was only 12 years older than Lydia herself. Her husband was 16 years her elder. The Reverend and Mrs. Coleman had only been married five years when Lydia moved in with them, and by the time that Lydia arrived, the Colemans had three children under the age of five. It is easy to think that Lydia was more household help than daughter. Eventually, the Colemans would have eight children, and none of the genealogies or family histories online is there a mention of Lydia being a member of the household. Records do re reveal that Betsy, Mrs. Coleman, had been sent to live with the Klaus family when her Aunt Elizabeth was dying, and it was probably there that she formed a close bond with Lydia and Caroline at the time. The gods were working in Caroline's favor, however. Heart's Ease, as the home in LaGrange was called, was given a blessing by the boss carpenter when construction was completed in 1939. Peace and plenty, always full and never empty. And so it was. Generation after generation of family members came to live at Heart's Ease, some for a short time, and others like Carolyn, shown third from the right, um, for their entire lives. Whereas the Christmas season might previously have been a reminder of her mother's death, Christmas of 1851, her first at Heart's Ease, found Caroline in a whole new world. One of her gifts that year was five drawing books from her aunt Adelia Nichols, who also lived at Heart's Ease. Caroline wrote to her sister Lydia about the books from which I hope I will soon learn to draw well. It seems such a small gift, but in a way it was also Caroline's rebirth in a loving household where her talent was recognized and nurtured. Among the earliest pencil sketches in the collection is this one, dated 1853. Clearly her 1851 Christmas wish was being realized and she was indeed learning to draw well. Her more formal training began at the Poughkeepsie Female Academy, located at 12 Cannon Street. Opened in 1837, the school was considered a first-class school in every sense. 
The course of study there included all the basics of the time, Latin and French, geology, algebra, penmanship and elocution, and others maybe not so basic, evidences of Christianity, the etymology of words with their prefixes and suffixes, and mental philosophy. Among the optional courses that attracted Caroline were drawing, pencil, crayon, painting in watercolors or oils, and sketching from nature. The walk from Overlook Road, depending on the route, was at least five miles one way and would easily have taken her an hour and a quarter to get there. There is additional evidence pointed to here on these papers that she took lessons from Samuel F. B. Morse. For at least three years, between 1862 and 1865, Caroline studied with Frederick Rondell. Harris born and trained, Rondell was lured to Poughkeepsie by Matthew Vassar to paint documentary pictures of his three ancestral homes. On February 10th, 1862, Rondell took out a newspaper ad announcing the opening of his studio for ladies at his residence in Mansion Square, the corner of Clinton Street. He was also a professor of painting at the Cottage Hill Academy. Beyond his role as an art instructor, Rondell became a friend and a mentor to Caroline, advising her not only on her art, but also on the business side of her career. An 1865 entry in her cousin Edmund Hart's diary recounts a chance meeting with Mr. Rondell in Farnham's drugstore, where Rondell was profuse in his expression of admiration for Carrie's artistic efforts. He predicts a brilliant reputation for her in a very few years if she only labors as assiduously in the cultivation of her talents as she has done. Hart also recorded that Rondell brought his students to painting parties along the Wappingers Creek at Hart's Ease. Another great influence on her development as an artist was a group of people brought to Poughkeepsie by Matthew Vassar for his great experiment, a college dedicated to the higher education of women. Although Caroline was never formally enrolled as a student at the college, she somehow became enmeshed in the culture of the institution and formed a close circle of friends, teachers, and mentors from those associated with Vassar and attended dozens of college programs and events as evidenced by invitations and programs such as these. Dutchman Henry Van Ingen was hired as the college's first professor of art and art history. Educated in The Hague, he had specialized in landscape painting. Van Ingen was known for leading students out of the classroom to sketch nature. How Caroline came to know him is unknown, but they became friends and he encouraged her, advised her, and in 1878, purchased her painting, Contentment, for the art collection being developed at the college, promising his students to meet Miss Klaus, the artist. One of the more unusual friendships that Caroline formed at Vassar College was the one she established with Mariah Mitchell. Appointed in 1865 to be included in the original nine member faculty, Mariah and her widowed father took up residence in the observatory, the first building completed on campus. Again, there's no documentation as to how the two women became friends, but they were close enough that the unmarried Mitchell felt comfortable encouraging Caroline to meet Chester Arthur. Mitchell wrote to Caroline, he was well-born, is well-trained, sufficiently educated, and very efficient. He is remarkably handsome. I think your domestic happiness will be perfect as his tastes are aristocratic. It will be best for you to come for him with a carriage. Eat him well and make much of him and he will not stray. One presumes it wasn't the Chester Arthur, but in any event, the matchmaking didn't work out as Caroline, like Mariah, remained unmarried throughout her life. The late 1860s through the 1870s finds Caroline in her most productive and prolific years as an artist. Dozens of letters from Archibald Wilson, bookseller and stationer at 295 Main Street in Poughkeepsie, just off to the right, not visible in this photograph, report on sales of her pictures. 
sold the cosette for $250 without frame to Dr. Beadle of this city. April 1873 sold the investigation for $400 with a new frame. Considerable amounts of money in the time period. 1876 sold the lambs to John P. Adrian's for $70. In the summer of 1872, her uncle Benjamin, recognizing her successful career and created a studio for her at Heart's Ease. She's standing in the door to her studio and happily I can report that that building still remains on the Heart's Ease property today and has recently been restored by the current descendants of the Hart Hubbard family who reside there. The crowning achievement of her career was her selection as one of the exhibitors in the 1876 Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. Considered one of the signal cultural events in mid 19th century America, her painting, Cattle at the Brook, hung not in the women's gallery, but in the main gallery with the likes of celebrity artists like John Lafarge, Sanford Gifford, Jervis McAtee, and Albert Bierstadt. This view of the main gallery shows her paintings placement in a style of installation common for the period. With national acceptance accomplished, Caroline became a local leader in the art world. And in 1882, along with her friend, Henry Van Ingen, artist James Smiley and sculptor George Bissell, she was selected to be on the exhibition committee for the first art show at the recently completed Vassar Brothers Institute. 167 paintings were exhibited in seven galleries throughout the three floors of the building. 30 paintings were displayed in the South Room on the first floor in a fashion probably very similar to that that you see here in the main gallery of the Centennial Exhibition. Caroline herself had five paintings in the exhibition along with those done by her friends and mentors, Van Ingen and Rondell. Among other notice, Noted artists of the day shown in the exhibit were Lily M. Spencer, Frederick Church, Jasper Cropsey, the Smiley Brothers, and Sanford Gifford. Many of the paintings were loaned by the elite of Poughkeepsie, J.F. Winslow, George Innes, J.P. Adrians, William H. Talmadge, and Mrs. Samuel F. B. Morse. An 1881 newspaper clipping found in Caroline's purse suggests she was confident in the choices she had made for herself over the past three decades, believing that a woman was not limited, but her place was the one that she can fill. While the Centennial Exposition was a great moment in American art, it was at the same time a period of great tension in the East Coast art community. A confrontation between New York landscape painters who supported native training and the figure painters of Philadelphia and Boston who advocated European study. Ultimately, the latter, the two shown on the right, would prevail and Caroline and others like her would fall from favor and quite likely the commercial success she once enjoyed diminished. While the first of Caroline's life can be described as a time of turmoil and tribulation, the last years happily were lived out in contentment surrounded by the extended family that had from her early teens provided her with love, encouragement, and stability. Following the Civil War, two of Caroline's cousins, Ambrose and Walter, both veterans of the Civil War and having served in the South, persuaded their father to purchase land in Florida where they would soon build homes and establish orange groves. Eventually, four of the Hart siblings would make Federal Point, Florida their, private, their primary residence. Caroline too purchased land there and went on to establish her own working orange grove. By 1869, she had established a studio for, oh, for herself on the property and took up painting the animals and the landscapes of her Florida backyard. And here are two examples of the paintings done in Florida. For nearly the three decades that followed um, in Caroline's life, her paintings revolved around both Heartsey's in LaGrange and Three Oaks in Federal Point, Florida. The 1900 census reveals that three of the seven Hart children were back living at Heartsey's, and so was Caroline. 
and she remained there until her death on November 16, 1904. At some point, the precise date unknown, Lydia, Sister Lydia too, came to live at Heartsease and was there to care for Caroline in her last days, during which time Lydia remarked that they learned to know each other better than ever before. Caroline was married with Bailey Plot and LaGrange alongside her father, who had died in 1897. 27 years later in 1931, Lydia was laid to rest beside them, reuniting the two sisters with their father. In 1859, Lydia wrote to Caroline and said, you say you are wedded to your easel. And so it seems she was. Fulfilling the promise she made to herself to learn to draw well, she mastered her craft and left behind an incredible body of work that attests to the quality of women artists of the time who were often overlooked and marginalized, choosing as you see in the bottom center to sign their paintings with their initials instead of their full names so as not to reveal their sex. A February 1870 letter from J.H. Wright, an associate of Caroline's, confirms that this was true in her case. Speaking of Goupil's, a Philadelphia gallery and painting supply store, Wright says, they suppose that you are a gentleman and I did not inform them. They predict a brilliant future for you. When your reputation is thoroughly established, I shall claim the pleasure to introduce you to them and enjoy the fun to see them open their astonished eyes. Family records indicate that Evensong, shown here, may be the last painting she completed before she died in 1904. For me, there's something comforting about the sheep finding safe shelter in the upended roots of the great tree much like Caroline had found her safe harbor at Heartsease. We've restored her paintings. The job ahead is to continue to restore her legacy. And while the exhibition of her work that we'd planned for 2020 was canceled due to COVID, we look forward to doing that as soon as we can safely do so. And we believe that with that, we'll firmly establish her place in the world of 19th century American art. And I would direct you to the website of the Historical Society where you can see additional information about her career and her paintings. Um, lastly, I can say that because of the work we've been doing and we've identified uh, at least 111 paintings that we know she completed, some maybe duplicates because of the names, but because of our work, these four that are um, in private hands have come to surface now and so we know of or more of her paintings that have been scattered um, around the country. And we're hopeful more will be discovered as we keep moving forward. So thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. Muted, sorry, I was muted there. Thank you, Melody and Bill. Uh, that I find this whole story about Carolyn Klaus so fascinating. Um, it's amazing the materials that you have in your collection, how you were able to piece together the story of her life. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, um, it, when, when the boxes came in, you know, and there are hundreds and you saw the letters, um, you know, we began to go through them. And I can tell you, we aren't anywhere near through them. And the interesting thing is Linda Hubbard, who donated uh, the collection, Linda and Stu Hubbard, um, Linda had organized the papers in the attic in the basement from this Hart Hubbard home. And the only way she could organize them was by the names on the outside of the envelope because you saw how the letters were all bound together. And she said that she simply would not have lived long enough to be able to take every letter out of every envelope and sort them by the sender as opposed to the recipient. And so, you know, while we found a lot, um, we also know that buried in all those other letters are probably letters from Caroline to other people, to cousins and other members of the family. So I, I don't know, Bill developed a pretty good sense for looking at a letter and being able to tell the handwriting and who wrote it. Um, it's, a, it's always a big historical mystery and sometimes you just get lucky. You know, you're just looking through things and something pops up, but 
um, it's it's just been fascinating to go through all the material. Bill, is there anything you want to add? No, I don't think so. I do think when you have the volume of things that we've been going through, you do get a nose. You know, you're looking for handwriting dates of a of a that something's been stamped um, or things that are bundled certain together. But it's, some of it times it just takes time, and it, it's just amazing to me what you can still learn about what happened 150 years ago. <laughs> Well, in some of it, once we established a timeline for her uh, for her life, then you could begin to narrow down letters that fall within the period of time that you're most interested in. Um, but as you can see, she led a long and interesting life, and and one that was in some ways quite wonderful, and other ways that was quite stressful. And I do think she was the lucky one who ended up in Heartsease as opposed to her sister who ended up in Virginia. You get letters from the sister wistfully wishing she could move, move Caroline down south with her. So it's kind of nice that they reunited at the very end of their lives. And now this is Denise. If, if I could just add or ask Melody or Bill to give a little further um, detail, but the real heroine of this story in my book is also Linda Hubbard, who many of us in Beacon know from her wonderful gallery on Main Street. But not only was Linda the steward of this, it was her husband Stewart's family, but um, the house was full of remarkable collection of centuries of items from this unbelievable family, from Revolutionary War, rifles to photographs to uh, just that huge house filled with stuff and this was part of it. Linda Hubbard really deserves an enormous amount of credit for the organization she did and then finding the right repositories for these items. So I just want to recognize Linda who really was instrumental. I was uh, active with the Dutchess County Historical Society at the time we acquired this collection and Linda really gets the kudos in my book. Linda spent four years after her mother-in-law passed away in 2008, Linda spent the next four years trying to bring some organization to the collection before she even really contacted us. And some of the papers that came from the Long Island branch of the family ended up at Hofstra University and they're fully cataloged down there as well. That's right, I'll add one more woman to the puzzle. Uh, Edith Hubbard was a family member between 1900 and the 1930s, who was very much like Linda Hubbard and the steward of things at that time. So, um, but I would equally say uh, to, for, for Linda to have had the foresight to do this and the work she put into organizing it, uh, having rested on the wonderful work of generations of family, it's a really rare thing. You know, Edith Hubbard um, was an art patron and friends with Alice Judson, who mm. was a beacon. And many of Alice Judson's rolled up paintings were left at heart's ease. And Linda Hubbard discovered them in the attic, unrolled them, cleaned them, framed them. And fortunately at the Historical Society, we have a number of Alice Judson's paintings. That's a good point. Yeah, there's a connection there for sure. Yes, exactly. Um, we have some comments that we want to share on, on the chat, but if people have questions, they can um, unmute themselves and ask the question, but I'll read some of the comments so far. This is from T. Craft, um, Jeff, Melody, Diane, BHS, and Hubbard family. Beauteous, thank you all for saving and sharing our Hudson Valley history, which is very true. <laughs> and from Anna, being the descendant of a talented painter, my great-grandfather was a Pennsylvanian impressionist I know how much work it is to preserve and promote an artist's legacy. Wonderful work. Thank you for sharing the story of Carolyn Morgan Klaus. And does anybody else have any, any comments or questions they'd like to share? You can um, unmute yourself. Okay, Lorraine. Yeah, I, I, I think every line that the two of you spoke, I was like, oh, I want to know more about that. I want to know more about that. So I really want to commend you. It has just truly been a wonderful evening and I could sit and listen to the two of you for days. I have a whole <laughs> list of questions, but one of the things that struck me as interesting, well, one of the many things that struck me as interesting was this idea of licensed women preachers. Mm -hmm. You know, in so many denominations, women are, you know, had to struggle to be ordained and there are still denominations where women are not part of the hierarchy. 
So what is a licensed preacher? How does that differ from an actual minister, if it does at all? Um, I think you were talking about the Methodist church, which I don't know that much about. But if you could just speak to that, I'd be fascinated. Uh, unfortunately, that may go a little beyond what I fully understand. I know that um, uh, there were, you know, there, there seemed to be some women who ignored it and continued to preach. And I don't know what that meant or entailed. And I, I can't say I really understand some of the subtleties of, of the difference. But it's, it's, I just found it interesting that uh, the Universalist Church and the Methodist Church were the churches right. where this was happening. Um, and obviously the women were, I mean, they were preaching. They weren't just, you know. Uh, and they were, they were effective. Preaching. And the argument was never, are they effective? Or um, I know there were some arguments that they should be allowed to be missionaries, but not here because they'll take men's jobs. I mean, they were kind of very practical Mm -hmm. in certain men's minds reasons um, that could be kind of wrapped up as godly reasons but there were some in, some clear examples where the, the guys really didn't want the competition but you couldn't deny that these women were converting people and that right. people found their words inspiring and motivating well i'm fascinated by that thank you are there any i think it's interesting that they were did you was it the boston theological Yes, Boston uh, is theological. Yeah. So, so obviously they were uh, allowed to pay to go to theological school, but then they couldn't practice after they were trained. So there's a bit of hypocrisy going on there, I think. Without and then the, the men would get their lodging paid for, and the women wouldn't. I mean, they did everything they could to discourage women from uh, hmm. even going to that school. Denise has. Could I just ask Bill maybe to give a, a brief overview of the Dutchess County Historical Society when it was founded, its collections, its reach, its breadth, all the great things it does? Oh. I think the folks here are a natural audience would love to know more about Dutchess okay. Historical. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Um, uh, I've, I've been here four years. Uh, Melody's been here longer, so she <laughs> has a better perspective, but maybe a new person's perspective is good too. I. I think what impressed me and attracted me about the Historical Society is that it was founded in 1914, and you recognize some of the active founders like Franklin Roosevelt, uh, and you see correspondence where he had ideas like the annual yearbook that, that became realized. Um, it was distinct for making sure that women uh, were active members, and the first pair that emerged, Helen Wilkinson Reynolds on research and Margaret DeMott Brown in photography, saw that this was going to be a very creative place. And what uh, I think makes the County Historical Society distinct is that from the very beginning, in addition to objects that it was uh, uh, taking care of, um, either at the Glebe House or now at Clinton House, in addition to objects, in addition to the preservation of documents, there was a real emphasis on publishing. So we've had a yearbook come out every year since 1914 and occasionally publish books. And I think this dimension of interpretation, oh, there you go, <laughs> thank you, Diane. Diane's doing the plug for the yearbook, there it is. Um, this, the fact that so much emphasis is put on a foundation of collections and preservation uh, and interpretation is built on that, interpretation through all the many, many pages of publications is what's attractive about the historical society be, at the county level because it really uh, puts an emphasis on narratives and turning things and facts and events and dates into stories that we can understand. And you can see it's almost endless. And I think that's what's attracted Melody and I. Uh, we try to look to our own collections. We like to work with uh, uh, partner historical societies and, and piece together these stories. So I think that's what is really distinct about the County Historical Society. Um, Bill, can you talk about the, the Klaus videos that you've created? That oh are yeah. Available to the public? So we've, we have tried to, uh, even before COVID, put a good deal of emphasis on digital because we felt often, you know, there would be a yearbook or there'd be a talk or, or whatever, and then it would kind of go away. And we thought, what a shame, you know? And we've tried to organize around certain topics. 
um, underrepresented histories like women's histories, black history, veterans stories of service, um, and really have a good deal online. And in, if, if the, there's a good deal online related to suffrage, and there is a particularly good amount, the Caroline Clow's online exhibition is built into four stages, her, her, early, her early life, uh, her becoming an artist. Then we look at her work, and then we look at her legacy, how it declined and came back. And the, the videos in there include uh, like a conversation Melody had with the donor, Linda Hubbard, uh, or a comparison of Caroline Clow's art with uh, the competing European uh, new art trends that kind of saw landscape painting uh, kind of fade into the background. That's, that's narrated by uh, Candy Lewis, who is a board member with an art degree. So I've kind of you know, tried to organize it and drill down in certain, in certain areas. And it's a, really meant to be a very self-guided tour. And those are accessible on your website? Bill? Yes. They're incredible. If you haven't had a chance to see them, they're, they're so informative and lovely. They really are. They're beautiful. Oh, thanks. Nicely done. Very nicely done. And Bill is modest because Bill creates those. Oh, yeah. I consciously, starting 10 years ago, started to take classes in digital stuff. How do you make a video? I took a class. How do you do a web? I took a class. I made a specific effort because I thought, God, there are all these great stories, but, um, you know, it, it can be both money and time consuming. And so, and there's nothing like doing it yourself, right? You're total control. So, um, Bill, post COVID, will is the Dutchess County Historical Society open to, to visitors? We will, yeah, we, I mean, we have every plan to go back to normal. I think every indication though is that people say when you go back to normal and have in-person meetings again, still add the Zoom or to, <laughs> remote element. I think we plan to do that. But I, you know, the plan is to get back. We have, a, a, we're so lucky to have the Clinton house um, where our archives are, where we have meeting rooms uh, and a library. It would be good to, uh, I know we, we missed the DAR, uh, coming to uh, have regular meetings there. So we are eager to get back to nor just where we were with the addition, I think, a big addition of more Zoom access. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, um, is there, if there's anything else, um, I, I'd like to close with reminding you um, about visiting our website at beaconhistorical.org, uh, our Facebook page and Instagram, where we keep you up to date on latest events and happenings. And um, in case you haven't gotten a, a copy of the um, Beacon's Memory Keeper and Storyteller, Robert J. Murphy, Denise, can you <laughs> share a little bit about that? Uh, sure. So uh, most folks who are with us tonight are well aware that we had a fabulous history hero in Beacon named Bob Murphy. Bob was our society president and newsletter editor for 38 years. And uh, Bob and I began, this is our third collaboration on a book, uh, working together on it early last year and regrettably uh, an illness that he had progressed to the point and we, that we lost him in July. And I'm, I'm committed to him that I would publish his collective anthology of work and um, that's what's available there. So it's a great read, whether you're a Beaconite born or a Beaconite just by interest, um, it really makes for some great reading, and I, and I know that anybody on this Zoom would really appreciate it. Bob was terrific, and it, this is his legacy, but uh, it's nice, short installments, easy to read. It's uh, $40. We have it available in a couple of places in Beacon, but you can also find it on our Beacon Historical Society website with a $10 shipping fee. The total is $50, and I guarantee it's worth 10 times that. Who's with me on that? Diane? Absolutely. All right, right? excellent. So buy a couple. And actually, <laughs> they're still available locally, Denise? They, they are still available. And um, right now, I have uh, just a little over 60 copies left on hand. Um, and so I'll soon, I hope, be going into a second printing. But you can still pick up your copies at Bob's Corner Store, Beacon Bath and Bubble, or Beacon Delights um, in and around Main Street and Beacon, or again, on our website, beaconhistorical.org. Yeah, and I will do local deliveries. So. Or, or ship them anywhere across the country. 
and if please check out our website uh, we have some really nice items on our gift shop now so um, Mother's Day is coming up graduation well, I'd like to thank Bill and Melody for a really an incredible program. Thank you so much, and thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Well, thanks thank for you. inviting Very us. Good. Pleasure. Nice to be with you. Always. Thank you. Our next thank meeting, you. Um, thanks. thanks for having us. April 27th, we're going to have Emily Murnane, who is one of our trustees, uh, talk about the history of the Dutch Reformed Church in Beacon, and that should be another fascinating topic. So I hope you can join us at that time. And thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Everybody stay well. That was nice. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.